Okay, are you are you on there? On. I think I'm on. I got a green light. Well, good morning. Our lesson this morning is uh, biblical infallibility. It's from uh, Jeffrey Hamilton, La Vista Church of Christ, and it's actually uh, a one of a three part. Uh, can we trust the Bible? Um, the Bible's claim for itself, and the arguments against the Bible. We need to trust in the Scriptures, and it's important for every Christian, because the Bible is the center of our faith. Um, we're Christians because we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures inspired by God, beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, correction, and training in righteousness. Believing in the Bible's message will save our souls. We see that in James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, and receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. The Scripture is powerful. It is alive. It is relevant. But many people don't trust the Bible. It is the most widely circulated book and read book in the world, but is also the most criticized. Atheists, evolutionists, modern theologians, even entertainers are constantly questioning the integrity of the Scriptures. So why is it important for us to trust the Bible? If we don't trust the Bible, if we believe it isn't true, then there's no reason, there's no reason to, according to the Scriptures, according to the teachings. If the Bible is not true, Christianity is a hoax. If it's not true, then it must be a lie. It's a product of men, and it's not worth following. If the Bible is the product of a holy God who cannot lie, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, then the only thing that he could inspire men to write is a perfect account of his will. If you've if you think about it, without the Bible, there is no standard for right or wrong. So what do we mean by the statement, the Bible is inspired by God? From Clark Pinnock, A Defense of Biblical Infallibility, page 1, he says the Bible is entirely, the Bible in its entirety is God's written word to man, free of error in its original autographs, wholly reliable in history and doctrine. Its divine inspiration has rendered the book infallible or incapable of teaching deception and inerrant, not liable to prove false or mistaken. Its inspiration is plenary, which extends to all parts alike. And it's verbal, including the actual language form, and confluent, a product of two free agents, human and divine. Inspiration involves infallibility as essential property, and infallibility in turn implies inerrancy. So let's examine this carefully. The Bible is God's word to man. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us 
in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. The entire Bible is God's word to man. We cannot pick and choose the parts that we like. It is free from error in the original manuscripts. We don't mean that there has never been errors in the copies or translations of the text, but we are certain that these errors are slight because we have no reason to doubt our translations. It is completely reliable in history and doctrine. The history recorded in the Bible is true and accurate. No evidence has ever shown it otherwise. Archaeologists use the Bible when they're searching for things. And they have backed it up repeatedly to the embarrassment of the skeptics. Uh, the doctrine is pure, entire, and true, as we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. Following teachings in the Bible is our only safe course. It is infallible. It cannot teach deception. It will not teach anything false. It is inerrant. It will not be proven false. 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1 Verses 22 through 25. <clears throat> Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for the sincere love of the brothers <clears throat> excuse me, and sisters, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and in all its glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. It is inspired, <clears throat> or God breathed, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. In other words, it came directly from God. Uh, plenary means holy, all parts, all scripture is inspired. Verbal means the very selected selection of words are inspired. God did not merely give the writers ideas to put down on paper. Confluent means that both God and man were involved in the writings of the Bible. God used men to reveal his will. <laughs> the idea of inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy stand or fall together. Without one, the rest are meaning, meaningless. <clears throat> the Bible's claim for itself. When, when talking about whether we can trust the Bible, it may seem strange to turn to the very book that we're talking about. We want to show that it is not an optional belief. The Bible claims to be infallible. If it's not in all cases, then the whole book is not inspired. First, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. It comes directly from God. It encompasses the entire Bible. Uh, the scriptures are permanent. John chapter 10, verse 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be nullified. The Scriptures cannot be broken. They cannot be found false. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. The law would not pass away until its purpose was fulfilled. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus' words would outlast this universe. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The scriptures are the revelation of God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, 
quotes Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial of the wilderness. Matthew chapter 22, verse 43. David, in the Spirit, wrote Psalm 110.1. He said to them, Then how does David, in the Spirit, call him Lord? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Consider how often the writer says, thus says the Lord, or the word of the Lord came to me saying. The very word of words of God were given to the prophets to speak. Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. Then Moses came and reported to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances and all the people answered with one voice, saying, All the words which the Lord spoke, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with the twelve memorial stones for the twelve tribes of Israel. Jeremiah. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 9, God puts his words in Jeremiah's mouth. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 13, the apostle spoke in the word that the Spirit taught. Has Christ been divided? Let's go to chapter 2, verse 13. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Titus cha uh, chapter 1, verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. God cannot lie. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Unlike man, God keeps his word. God is not a man that he would lie, nor a son of man that he would change his mind. He has said... And he, he, has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God's people are not to lie. Part of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, ridding yourselves of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexual immoral, persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. While men may ignore God and lie, 
The followers of God will try not to. These are the men God used to reveal his word. The scriptures were not limited to just the current generation. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses uh, 9 through 13. Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the time of the year, the release of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, at the place which he choose, you shall read this law before all Israel, so that they hear it. The law was to be read every seven years. Uh, verses 24 through 29, words will condemn future generations when they go astray. It came about when Moses finished writing the words of the law in the book until they were complete, that Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, so that it may remain there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, as long as I have been alive with you until today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more then after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing, and call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against them. For I know that after my death you will behave very corruptly, and turn from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will confront you in the latter days, because you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands." The scriptures were written so future generations may praise God. Psalm 102, <clears throat> verse 18. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. It is a permanent record. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brothers and sisters, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory flower of grass. The grass withers and flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And it is delivered once and for all. Jude 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all, once for all time handed down to the saints. What did Jesus say about the scripture? John chapter 1 verse 1, Jesus says that he was God in the flesh. We can trust him since God cannot lie. Jesus believed in the absolute integrity of the Old Testament. The scriptures were of divine origins. Matthew chapter 22, verse 43, Jesus said David was inspired. In Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus rebuke Satan with the scriptures, often saying, it is written. Frequently, Jesus refers to the scripture with the phrases, the Spirit says, God says, hear the words of the Lord. Every minute matters were important. Even, even minute matters were important. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus says, Not a jot or a tittle will pass away. A small incident in uh, Solomon's life shows the condemnation of the Jews. 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We see in Luke chapter 17, verse 27. People were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, and they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Down in verse 32, remember Lot's wife. We have to remember what happened to Lot's wife was important. The very wording was important to Paul. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as one would in referring to many, but rather as in referring to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. No doubt is ever expressed in the Scripture. The Scriptures cannot be broken. John chapter 10, verse 35. The New Testament is included in Scripture. Paul wrote the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. To reject the message is to reject God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 2 and 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Note two quotes from Scripture. For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Paul's writings are called Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 and 16. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our brother, beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them these things, in which there are some things that are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do, also the rest of the Scripture, to their own destruction. And we're not done, because just just because something claims to be true, it doesn't make it so. Many false teachers claim to have the truth, but they don't. And we need to see if the Bible measures up to its own claims. Are we convinced that God has given His revelation to mankind to save them from their sins? James chapter 1, verse 21 asked, Are you able to save your souls? Arguments against the Bible. Arguments have not changed much over the years. The same are given today as hundreds of years ago. It's all or nothing. Do we have to insist on the total infallibility of the Scriptures? Some fear that one error would overthrow all of Christianity. However, if the writers of the Bible were wrong on one point, how do you know they did not err on some other point? Now, the Bible insists on inerrancy. Again, 2 Timothy 3.16, it comes from God. In Numbers 23, 19, God cannot lie. The Bible can only be proven false if God has lied about His Word. However, God is always true. Romans chapter 3, verse 4. We should never be fearful of defending the Bible. Does inspiration guarantee that non-essential details, trivial, uh, trivialities are accurate? How can we as fallible men determine 
what is trivial and not essential. What superficially appears to be trivial may, upon deeper reflection, be a rich depository of truth. For example, Paul requests to bring his cloak in 2 Timothy 4.13. Surely these things can't be inspired. Why did Paul leave his cloak in Troas? Was he forced to flee and had no time to pick it up? Perhaps this indicates that Paul continued to be persecuted in his later years. Think of Paul's sacrificial poverty. Paul was willing to spend and be spent for the cause of Christ. Winter is coming. Paul's one cloak is 100 miles away. Paul was not a stranger to cold or nakedness. What happened to the saints in Rome? They had originally welcomed Paul enthusiastically, rushing out to meet him as he approached Rome. We see in Acts chapter 28, verse 15. Had many of them been scattered in the persecutions? Had some of them turned against Paul? During Paul's first trial, no one stood up for him in defense. During the second time in Rome, only Luke was with him. Perhaps the saints' love had grown cold. Notice Paul's fortitude. No word of complaint, no whimpering, no browbeating of neglected brethren, no pitiful solicitation of others. Even the small details in the Old Testament were considered factual and doctrinal teaching based on them. God's promise to Abraham, the S on seeds in God's promise, the minor event occurring to Lot's wife, Minor event, turned to salt. But he wanted you to remember that. All Scripture is for learning. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. The Bible must be accepted as whole. The accuracy of its contents. Typical argument is that the Bible cannot be true because it got some historical details wrong. When the Bible records an event, that event actually happened. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Most often the arguments are based on what we don't know. Then some discovery is made that shows common accepted belief is wrong, and the Bible is right. There is so much we can cover under this point that we can spend an entire lesson on that point. We don't have the original documents. Another line of argument that is there, that there are mistakes in the Bible, such as conflicting information. Even though we do not have the original documents, we believe the original documents to be accurate. Some might point out that since we have never seen the original, we cannot prove our point. However, they cannot prove that there were errors in the original. The question is, do we believe the Bible came through the working of the Holy Spirit? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. For example... When did Jehoiakim begin reigning and how long did he reign? Second Kings chapter 24 verse 8 and Second Chronicles chapter 36 verse 9 give two different numbers. When dealing with dates, we tend to be precise with small values and begin rounding as the value gets larger. We're likely to say that we moved into our New home three years ago, instead of noting that we moved into our home three years, two months, one day, five hours, and 33 minutes ago. Therefore, for one to account to say he ruled three months and the other to say three months and ten days is simply a difference of a degree of rounding was done in the two records. The starting date is most likely due to copyist error. 
The difference between 18 and 8 is one letter. Two old translations, the Syrian and the Arabic, Arabic, have 18 in both accounts. Another possible explanation is that many kings trained their successors. David did this with Solomon to prevent contentions over who would succeed him to the throne, and it became common practice amongst his heirs. It is possible that Jehoiakim became began a co-regency with his father starting at the age of eight, and became the sole king at the age of 10, but he only reigned for three months and 10 days. However, eight would be unusually young to start co-regency, so I don't think it's a possibility that it's quite likely. Besides, in 2 Kings 24.15, it says... So he led Jehoiakim into exile to Babylon, also the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the leading men of the land they led into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. He had wives. A final possibility comes from when you start counting years. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, it said Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 42 years over Israel. In, in, in this verse, the literal Hebrew sounds like Saul started reigning when he was one year old, but likely what is being stated in the event occurred in the first year of his reign. It just sounds odd to Americans because we don't speak of time in that matter. Joachim's father reigned for 11 years, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 36. In the fourth year of his reign, the Babylon, Babylonian captivity began when Jehoiakim was 10 years old. We see that in Jeremiah 25, verse 1. Thus, it is possible to say that Jehoiakim was both 18 from his birth and 8 from the captivity at the same time. Which brings up the question... Are the copies and translations unreliable? There have been mistakes made, but there have been minor and easily spotted because each copy translation does not make the same mistakes. The Dead Sea Scrolls show how accurate our copies of the Old Testament were, even though previously our oldest copy was over 1,000 years newer than the scrolls. Scholars have placed the error rate on our Bibles at less than half a percent. And all the problem areas don't make much difference in our understanding of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, God promised that the Scriptures would never pass away. That means God is watching over our Bibles to see that His Word is preserved. The presence of miracles means it's a myth. Basically, the argument is that miracles do not occur today, therefore, they never occurred. The resurrection of Jesus could not have happened because it doesn't continue to happen. The definition of a miracle is that it is a supernatural event, not a natural one. It goes against the laws of nature. If people commonly were resurrected, then that would be a natural event. The real question is there evidence that the laws of nature were overridden? But the argument is circular. The concept of God is a supernatural being, but they are assuming that the supernatural cannot exist. Therefore, they start out assuming that God cannot exist. With that assumption, no wonder they can't entertain the idea that the Bible may be inspired. But if God does exist, and God created the world, then it would not be a stretch to assume the same God can bend the rules he made when he wants. Thus, the starting assumption changes the resulting conclusion. Instead of ruling out the possibility before we begin, the challenge is to decide if there is sufficient evidence that miracles did take place. 
One of the things offered in the Bible is testimonies from eyewitnesses to the miracles. You don't find that in Greek mythologies or other mythologies. Statements by these witnesses in from the hostile audiences are not denied as to facts. The records are not denied when they were first written. Hence, the presence of miracles does not instantly falsify a document. We could go on and on. But we know that the Bible will. What will you do with the Bible? Will you keep finding excuses to deny what it says? Or will you accept the realities of the truth? That's the lesson for this morning. I don't know if there's anyone here that needs to respond to the invitation, but we're going to offer one. If you have a need for put on Christ in baptism, if you had need for prayers, uh, for forgiveness, for strength, or whatever, whatever your need might be, won't you come while we stand and sing?